Praise the Lord. All right. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, this is not going to be an end time thing message. <laughs> People are like, oh, he's going back to Thessalonians again. They're talking about the tribulation on Christmas. No, we're not. We already did that. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians chapter four. We'll start in verse nine. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write unto you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do. So toward all the brethren who are all throughout Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Increase more and more in what? Love. 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 Interesting that Paul writes here, he says, he says, God has taught you to love. God has taught you to love. And he says, and I know that God has taught you to love because all the brethren throughout Macedonia talk about your love one for another. Love, we've been talking about for a few weeks, love is the ultimate expression is given through giving. This Christmas, this Christmas season, I was thinking as I was, as I was going over the notes in my mind before I write things down, and I thought about the Grinch, right? Who doesn't love the Grinch, right? Yes. yes. And it, the whole movie is him being angry. Right. Not necessarily at Christmas, but at people. And certainly we can all understand that. Right. Yes. Right? Right. <laughs> I mean, you, you go to Costco on the Friday before Christmas. <laughs> Christmas up here. I love it. I love Christmas. But I love what Christmas is. With the Grinch, the Grinch has a revelation. Doesn't he? Yes. Yeah. And what happens? His heart, His heart grows three times that day. What does that represent when we say our heart grows? My mom told me when, when Kathy and I got married, we were talking and she said, she said, she said, honey, the heart always makes more room. Yeah. Yes. The heart always makes more room. Yes. And then I was thinking about Scrooge. <laughs> so our friends, well, you know, you, Dana was here a couple of few weeks ago, right? And so she posted because her husband likes the old original George C. Scott Scrooge. Yeah. Yeah. Which she equates to him being like General Patton. <laughs> and I have watched that, that version of it, and it is dreary. Yeah. Give me a Muppet Christmas yeah. or a Big House Christmas <laughs> any day of the week. I, and I'm happy. Yes. What is it about the Scrooge, though? What is it about Scrooge? Scrooge is all about the money. Yeah. You know, the Bible tells us that the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. No. 
Jesus actually said, your Father in heaven knows you have need of all these things that everybody else is seeking after. But he said, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God, he'll add all that to you. Hallelujah. Yeah. And there are people who take the verse that says, you'll have the poor among you always as a mandate to be poor. That's not what Jesus is saying. No. The, the, the people are poor because they don't know how not to be poor. Yeah. Yeah. They don't know that they don't need to be poor. Do you know that every nation where the gospel goes, the poverty level goes down? Yeah. And wealth index rises? Yeah. Why? Because the gospel is meant to increase. Amen. Amen. Come on, the gospel is the good news. Yeah. Why is it good news to the poor? Yeah. You don't got to be poor no more. Amen. Right? Absolutely, it gives hope that there's something better, something greater. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So, Scrooge, he goes and has the, his epiphanies and visitations and all this stuff. And what is it he realizes that he's missed out on? Love. He missed out on love. He's missed out on family. He's missed out on joy. When he wakes up, what is the first thing he starts to do? Give. He starts giving money away. He starts buying things for other people. Why? Because the very nature of God is to give. That's right. It is the very nature of God to give. The Grinch, he says he's, he, he he puts a, a little a little antler on his dog, and you know the dog is going to be his his reindeer, and he's going to be Santa Claus, and he's going to be the anti Santa. He's going to he's going to take everything from everybody. Who does that? John, according to John 10.10, 10, the devil comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. Grinch gets a revelation, and instead of taking, what does he do? He starts giving everything back. He starts giving everything back that he started to steal. He joins in with fellowship and fun, and enjoys, and has a heart of love and giving. Right? Right. Right. <clears throat> God so loved the world. Most, most people in the world know, know this verse. They don't, they don't know really it, but they've heard it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever should believe on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What is the very nature of God? Well, we, we've been reading and we've been studying. God is love. love. God is love. And whoever is born of God loves. Right? Whoever is born of God loves. God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. The selfish life is the empty life. Scrooge and Grinch were selfish. And as a result of that, their lives were empty. They didn't have any money. I mean, sure, the Grinch had the dogs. The dogs are loyal to you no matter how you treat them. The self-centered life is the miserable one. We can see that Scrooge and the Grinch are miserable. They're, They're detestable. They hate everybody. They hate everything until they get a revelation of love. Now, when we talk about Scrooge and the Grinch, it's, it's, a, it's a weak comparison to say that the love that they have, that they have found out, is the love of God. What they have found is the love of giving to other people. The love of being with other people. Finding out that that miserable life and that miserable existence they had of selfishness and self-centeredness had led them to an empty life and a miserable life. But the giving life is the fulfilling life. I love, I love the very end of, of, of Scrooge. A, a Christmas Carol. <coughs> because he becomes so giving. Right. And what does his life now become? It's a fulfilling one. It's not just fulfilling for him, but it's fulfilling for others. When we give to other people, we are fulfilling in ourselves. Jesus said that when we give, our joy is made full. Amen. Paul said, when we give, our joy is made full. Now, People who never give. Listen, there are people inside the church and people outside the church that never give anything. Remember in, 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 in A Christmas Carol? And there's the, the, that one angel 
<clears throat> opens his robes and there's the two the two children begging. Yeah. And Proverbs says that the the, um, the the wicked has two children. Give me a give me. Yeah. Right. It's it's that attitude of giving and giving that gets us out of out of a fulfilling life. And keeps us in a miserable life. Give me this or give me that or give me, right? The unselfish life is the satisfying life. Jesus unselfishly, willingly came to this world. And he said he did it for the joy set before him. Jesus, in John 6, 38, says that he, he says, I have come down from heaven. I have come down from heaven. Jesus left heaven. He didn't have to. I mean, he left, he left what is a, a, a royal palace of heaven with streets paved with gold to be born in a, in a, in a, in a shepherd's manger and put to, put to sleep. In a, in a trough, a feeding trough for animals. Would you say he gave up a lot for that? But he did it for the joy that was set before him. The joy of giving. One of, one of the models of, of Christmas is it's the season of giving. And we know that it's the season of giving because we're celebrating the one who came down. Yes. See, we can't, we can't look at Christmas without thinking about Easter. You can't think of it. You can't look at God becoming man and dwelling with us without thinking about him living on the earth and teaching and leading the way to God and then going to the cross where he said, I could have called 10,000 angels. But he didn't. Because the joy set before him was you and I. The joy set before him is many sons being called unto righteousness. And for those who, who think that only men can get saved and women have to get saved through childbirth, you really need to talk, check your doctor because when he says sons, he means female sons and male sons. Yes. God's not confused. Right. The world is really confused about it. Right. But God still made male and female. Yes. So when he calls us sons, he calls us all sons. All right? Philippians chapter 2. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Now, just like you, I don't have all these things bookmarked in my Bible for this morning either. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it to be rob consider robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. No reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Jesus left his portion, his portion in heaven to take on the form of a man to save mankind. So you can't, you can't think Christmas, this people say, well, you know, Christians shouldn't celebrate Christmas. Why not? Why not celebrate something that celebrates the Messiah? Amen. Amen. Come on, you... I love this. My pastor says, I'm not afraid of this. I'm not afraid of Santa Claus. I'm not afraid of the pumpkin. And I'm not afraid of the Easter bun. That's right. Amen. Amen. Listen, you, you can have Santa Claus in your house. We often had Santa Claus in our house. But Santa Claus was never the, he was never the object That's right. of Christmas. The object of Christmas has always been and will always be God incarnate, yes. dwelling with man yes. as a man. Yeah, yeah. God incarnate. God, the omnipotent God, 
the ever, the ever existent God, who's existed before time began and will exist long after time exists, right. came in the humble form of a man yes. to save mankind <coughs> because he loves us. Yes. I love Kathy. Kathy was listening to, to Brother Moore this morning. And, uh, I'll, I'll probably butcher this, but he, he said, if, when God saved you, it didn't come with it didn't come with a price tag of what you owe him. Right. That's right. That's right. Come on. When when Jesus came to save us, it didn't come with a price tag. This is what you have to pay to get to get your salvation and to keep it. Right. Right. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Yeah. Yes. That's right. That's right. Amen. So when, when when a brother or sister, listen, when we're walking in love with one another. You don't have to correct me. I don't have to correct you. I mean, unless unless you're, you're doing something like sleeping with your father, black, <laughs> then we're going to talk. <laughs> you know? And we're going on the assumption that this is not his mother. Because okay? that just adds a whole new level of you. <laughs> John chapter 17, verse 5. John chapter 17, excuse me, John 17, verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. What is Jesus praying? He's praying, now, Father, I've done everything you've asked me to do. I've, I've done... I've, we're coming to the end. I'm going to the cross. Glorify me with that same glory that I have with you since before the earth existed. Jesus is again telling us he existed as God in heaven who came down as the gift of God. The gift of God. Jesus is the gift of God. You can't repay him for that. Right. You, you, we, can't, we can't do enough good deeds to repay him for that. That's right. It is the gift of God. Okay. Now, we are commanded to love. That's the one thing we're commanded to do. John chapter 13, just a few pages over. John chapter 13, verse 34 says, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So how did Jesus love his disciples? How did Jesus love his he he preferred them? It actually says that he preferred them over himself. How do we know that he preferred us over himself? How many of you, being in the form of God, living in eternity in heaven? would say, okay, I will come born of a woman in a carnal fleshly body, be laid to sleep in a food trough, work with my hands all the day of my life to lead and teach others about God. Anybody? But he was willing. He was so willing to come and to leave all the glory and splendor of heaven because he loved. God so loved the world that he gave. Love gives. What is the ultimate expression of that love? No greater love is this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's right. You can't think of Christmas without thinking of giving. Amen. You can't think about giving without Jesus giving his life. Amen. You can't think about Jesus giving his life without the resurrection. Amen. You know, we call it Easter and people eat ham and all that other stuff. Well, good for you. I don't care what you eat. The Bible actually says if you have if you have if you have faith for that, keep it to yourself. Okay? If you have faith for things, there's something you just need to keep it to yourself. Everybody doesn't need to know what you're doing at home. I mean, some people you get you get together with them and they start telling you everything about their life. You're like, now there's no secrets. 
I have a memory. Right. That's right, he does. In John chapter 13, Jesus does something that is the most incredible act of service. He has come, he, he being God, in the form of God, not considering it robbery to be equal with God, put on hum, hum, humanity, lived with men, and the very last act he does before he goes to the cross to save all of mankind is he girds up his, his, his robe, gets a pail, fills it with water, and proceeds to wash his disciples' feet. As I have loved you, so also you ought to love one another. I'd say we should have a foot washing service here sometime, but nobody would show up. <laughs> People would be like, oh no, you're not touching my feet. Oh no, I'm not touching anybody else's feet. Not touching anybody else's feet. <laughs> but aren't you glad that we have this example of Jesus himself who washed his disciples' feet as an act of service to them? And, and, and Peter's like, no, Lord, you can't wash my feet. He said, if I don't wash your feet, then you're not clean. You have nothing of me. What does that mean? Unless you allow me to serve you, you don't understand true serving. Unless you allow me to do this for you, then you don't understand giving. You don't understand humility. You don't understand lowering yourself to serve others. Jesus didn't say it's the most popular person with the best voice and the best clothes that is the greatest in the kingdom. He said it's the least. The least of you is the greatest in the kingdom. What does that mean? That means the one who is the servant of all. Jesus was the servant of all. Right. He came and he served literally all of mankind for all history. Yep. Yes. In one lifetime. Yes. Amen. All of history, all of mankind in one lifetime. Jesus put everyone for all lifetime in history above himself. And he did it for the joy that was set before him. Back to Peter. And, and he says, well, then, okay, Lord, wash my whole body. You know, just give me a whole shower then. He says, no, you're already clean because of the word I spoke of you. But you need this, too. You need this act of service. You need this act of understanding of what it is to be a servant. First John chapter 3. You don't have to turn to all these. You can write it down. You can just listen. First John chapter 3. A little closer to me. It's always my goal to keep Christmas service short. Oh, okay. <laughs> so he said, no longer. <laughs> First John chapter 3, verse. Starting verse 16. And by this we know we love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has his words, this world's, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not just love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. What does that mean? You see somebody in need, you have the ability to help them, and you hold back. No. But then you go to church and say, love you, brother, love you, sister. You're just paying lip service. Yeah. That's just lip service of love. That's not real love. James talks about it. He says, he says we, we, we have love for one another because when we see somebody who's in need, we help them. How do, we, how do we know that we're supposed to do this? Because what did Jesus do? He gave. He came. He served. He humbled himself. He became like a servant. What is real, what does the real love of God look like? It looks like servanthood. It looks like serving others. It looks like preferring other people over yourself. Well, Jesus preferred all of mankind over himself. 
Can we prefer others over ourselves? Yes. Yeah. Well, can we prefer other people over ourselves? Yes. If Jesus did it, then he's our example. Yes. Then serving others is one of the greatest expressions of love. Yes. Otherwise, it's just it's just lip service. Love your brother, love your sister, pat them on the back on the way out of church. And you know, you know for a fact that these that the person you just said love you to is in need of something that you can help them with, and you've done nothing. Right. God could have just stayed in heaven and said, Well, I made them, I gave them the authority over the earth, they messed it up. Not my problem. True. Right. And he could have just said from heaven, I love you. How's that going to help us? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because God so loved the world, and he loved his creation so much, well, why did he love the devil? Well, the devil had free choice too. You know, people go around saying, well, angels are just autonomous and they don't have a choice. Well, if that's true, then the Bible's a lie. Because the Bible tells us that Satan was lifted up in pride and said, I will ascend to the Most High, and I will be like the Most High. <clears throat> Double, uh, angels are not autonomous. They have a choice. He took a third of the angels with him, according to Scripture. Right. That was not by force. Every, every creation of God has a choice. Right. And God doesn't want autonomous little robots. That just... right. You seen that Tesla robot? What's it called? Alexi or something like that? It's frightening. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it has an AI brain and it, it has this plastic face. And, dude, it looked at itself in the mirror. It was like. <laughs> Some of that stuff is frightening that's coming out. It's crazy. I still want the little Jetsons bubble car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, according, according to the Jetsons, we should have had that in 2022. Yeah. I'm just saying. Rosie? I want Rosie too. Yeah. And, you know, instead, of, instead of Rosie and the little bubble car, we've got people confused about what gender they are. Yeah. Yeah. And, and politicians say, yeah, hey, you're right, be confused. Yeah. 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 God was not confused when he made anybody. Jesus came because he loved us. And in his love, and showing his love for us, he became a servant. And he laid down his life for us. Jesus came to say, listen, this is really important. As Christians, so often we think that we need to correct everybody. Well, you're not doing this, or you need to do that, or you shouldn't do this, or you shouldn't wear that. Right. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. Amen. He came to the world to save the world. Amen. Yes. That through him, we might have everlasting life. When I hear somebody say, oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't talk to that person, or you, should, you shouldn't dress like that, that's condemning. Right. That's not the love of God. Well, the love of God will correct them. Well, that's what the Holy Ghost is for. Right. The Holy Spirit is for bringing correction. He's for helping us and teaching us and guiding us. Jesus spent a couple of chapters going over that in the book of John. When the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to lead you, guide you, correct you, re re uh, reprove you. He didn't say people 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 calling themselves Christians, holding Bibles and big crosses around their neck, and proclaiming proclaiming all of their love for God, and going around condemning people because they're not dressed the way that they think that they should be dressed for church, or because they're not living exactly the way that they see the Bible that a person should be living. Right. Well, a, a believer who's had the free gift of God for salvation yeah. just needs your love. You know, you can. You, there's an old, an old saying: you win more, you, you win more flies with honey than with vinegar. Vinegar, vinegar, vinegar right? Vinegar. 
right? Not that I'm trying to collect flies. Who's trying to collect flies? Who comes up with these sayings? I don't understand. But they don't land up. <clears throat> but you, you know, you, you, you put the honey out and they land in the, in the honey and you, you're going to get rid of those flies, aren't you? Well, that's probably why they said it. Oh, you get rid of them. It's not, it's not the condemnation. It's not the fault finding. Right. It's, it's not that I'm, I'm better than you. No. I, I like, you know, I, somebody, somebody, somebody backs their car at a church and, and I pull it next to them and I, I just pull it in front of them and I'm like, I'm still better than you. You know, because people who back their car at it, they're like, I'm better than everybody else. Hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually thinking of Paul. <laughs> I'm actually thinking of Paul. No, I'm not going to do I can too. I was just, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those funny things that you see on, on, on reels. I don't spend any time on reels, really, I don't. Yeah, yeah, I know. yeah sure. That's <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all need it. <laughs> we all need to laugh. <laughs> Come on. Church is not dreary and drudgery. No. Right. If you can't go to church and laugh and have a good time and fellowship with other believers, you need to come here. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. if you're going somewhere else and there's not fun and you're not laughing and there's not fellowship and there's not people complimenting you and telling you how good you look, come on, you all look so good. Thank you. Really, I was, I, I, I was, I was, I was super, that was a super compliment when, uh, when brother over here says, he says, I didn't know that was Kathy at first. She, she looked so different. And so and I'm like, yeah, that's my baby. Yeah. <laughs> It encourages. Amen. It doesn't tear down. It doesn't smash you. It doesn't make you feel bad. No. Love, when you found out that God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to save you from your sin, yeah. did that make you feel bad? No. No, no you're like, praise the Lord, I need some of that salvation. Right. Amen. Come on, right? Amen. What does that no even mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, selfish people don't give anything. No, they don't. Right. They don't give up their time. Oh, I'm sorry, you know, we, we, we can't help with that. We're busy. We, you know, we, we've got this plan or that plan. They don't, they don't help. They don't, they don't give of their finances to, to the church. They're not, they're not involved in, in anything. They're just, you know, oh, I have a need. Help me. I have a need. Help me. Right. Well, the new policy for benevolence in the church is if you're giving, we'll help you. If you're helping, we'll help you. No, I'm just making that up. Because we just love to give. We just love to give. I like to give. I like to give. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really, um, I, I, got, I got something, I, I got something in my heart that I really want to give to somebody. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it work so I can do that. And then I've got something else I need to give to somebody that's been in my heart. And I'm like, I have to wash that before I get that one. <laughs> so I was going to bring it with me today and give it to someone. I'm like, no, you need to wash it. It hasn't been washed in a while. <laughs> Listen, it is more blessed. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Right. Actually, it was, uh, I think it was Paul in the book of Acts. But anything, anything Paul said, you got to understand that's coming from the Lord. That's, right. that's coming from the Master. Right. He said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. Amen. I, I don't need anything for Christmas. <laughs> But I bought a bunch of stuff for Christmas. I'm excited about watching people open. Yeah, me too. I'm excited about, about more people getting hoodies. I'm excited about people getting their CDs. Yeah. Why? Because I love to give. We did, and this is not to boast on us, but we know that the board, um, the, the preschool had, had, had a need, and I, I knew about the need because she told me she had a need. And so I talked to the board, and we gave them twice, come on, we gave, we gave the, the preschool that rents from us twice the amount that they said they needed help. Amen. Amen. Why? Because Amen. we love to give. Amen. A, a cheerful heart is a giving heart. Amen. A giving heart is a cheerful heart. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen. Did you get anything out of this this morning? Yes. yes. Come on. God gave so that we could give. Amen. 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 